it is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Kerry Kogan. Dr. Kerry Kogan is a full professor here at the University of Ottawa uh, in the School of Psychology in the clinical department. Um, he's also a co-researcher of, of our on, on the project um, on black mental health. Um, it is a pleasure to work with Kerry. And uh, there are two, three professors in, in, in that project. Asuntan Dengoma. Asuntan, can you say hello? Just say hello. Asuntan Dengoma from Université du Québec en Outaoué. Um, she's doing a lot of uh, important work um, on racial disparities. And Kerry Kugan. So Kerry will be our spokesperson today for the project, and he, he will provide a lot of data. So be ready because <laughs> there will be like a lot of data. Kerry, you can. So please welcome Dr. Kerry Coogan. So good morning. I, I just want to say it's an honor. Um, it's an honor to be here, and I'm humbled to, to be here before you to, to present these data. Um, and and I, I want to say what a uh, pleasure it has been to work with uh, Jude Marie and Assumta for the last three years. I mean, it's it's just been a, an amazing learning experience. And um, I think somebody said, you know, the, the data that we heard about is kind of sad, and I'm sorry that I'm going to have to continue to present data that is, uh, you know, is, is difficult to hear, but, but, but familiar, I think, at an experiential level. So I'm going to be focusing on a component of, of the research uh, that, is, um, that is the quantitative data with the, the multiple components to this study, uh, to this research project. So I'll be talking about the design and methodology of a survey that we conducted go over the, the main findings uh, of, of, that, uh, of that study, some of the limitations and conclusions uh, that we can draw from, from the research. So the first kind of point is like, why, why are we doing this? I mean, I think, I think most of us know why we're doing this. Um, so, so just to go over, in, in 2020, the Public Health Agency of Canada launched, of course, this, this wonderful program in promoting health equity, Mental Health of Black Canadians Fund, to generate new evidence on culturally focused programs and interventions that address mental health and its determinants for Black Canadians. So there was obviously a recognition of in, an increasing need and a serious inequality in mental health care available across Canada for Black Canadians. So the fund was really meant to, to start to address these, this challenge. And um, you know, as, as Dr. Williams mentioned, the data and certainly the quantitative data is just not there and wasn't there. And so we, you know, we, we explored the literature to look at you know, what were the quantitative studies available on, on, on uh, black people living in Canada. And, and there's really little known about, about uh, black communities. Um, and of course, part of this is, is um, because of the structural colorblind approaches that Dr. Williams talked about in Canadian society, particularly in our healthcare system. And so as part of that project, what we wanted to do was address the gaps by characterizing, for example, the prevalence rates of uh, various forms of mental health problems um, among black Canadians. So what were the objectives for this component of the project? were to characterize prevalence of major mental health problems among, among black people, uh, among uh, people from black communities, examine the associations or association of mental health problems uh, with the experience of different forms of racism and that Dr. Williams so, so eloquently explained and, and described, um, and then examine the key sociodemographic characteristics that might influence uh, the expression of these mental health problems in black communities. So what, were the, what was the methodology that we used to do this? So there were really, um, you know, if we look at the larger project, there were three components. As I mentioned, there was, there's the, we were, wanted to document the social determinants of mental health problems among young black Canadians in particular. Um, other components of the project include educating, sensitizing and mobilizing black communities uh, around mental health problems. And third, to develop and evaluate uh, actual uh, culturally sensitive intervention programs for black communities in Canada. So I'll just be focusing on that first component of, of characterization of the, of the mental health problems and, and social determinants. And in that component, only on the quantitative uh, results, because we actually do have some qualitative data um, where we um, did some focus groups with various stakeholders from black communities. 
So um, we used um, m multiple methods to actually recruit people uh, from, from the black communities, including social media, um, posters in religious institutions like mosques and churches, uh, letters to community organizations. Uh, we have a system here at the University of Ottawa where um, uh, psychology students can, can, for credit, participate in research studies. So we recruited there. So we, we had this multi-pronged approach to, to engage and recruit from, uh, from black communities. And our inclusion criteria were uh, people who were self-identifying as black, able to understand English or French, uh, living in Canada, and between the ages of 15 and, and 40. So our participants uh, completed a survey online uh, uh, using Qualtrics, and we administered a whole bunch of measures uh, that, that we knew were, were able to, that had been validated, for example, in, in black communities and, and that were psycho psychometrically sound. And we actually have two waves of data collection. So it's a, it's a longitudinal study. Uh, and today I'll be presenting the results uh, from that first wave of data collection, um, which actually I think it happened, occurred before COVID. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's, been, it's been a while since that, and we've been able to publish that before and during for the second wave. Yeah. So, so that the, our, yeah, that's it's sort of like the reliable, um, you know, so if we take a measure today that, you know, in three weeks or four weeks from now, we're going to get the same result, that they're valid, you know, not all instruments have been actually um, administered in, in black communities. So do we know if this measure even really captures the thing that we think it's measuring, right? So we want, we were sensitive to, to, to finding measures that would actually be uh, relevant and give us data that we can interpret in a way that, that we can draw conclusions. Uh, about the participants. So, um, you know, this is a first really large study of, of uh, mental health of Black Canadians. So we have 860 participants uh, who completed this. And I will say thank you to those participants because, uh, you know, we were asking a lot of uh, difficult questions about their mental health. And, and uh, so that, that they were able to provide us with these data is, is, is really, I think, instrumental to understanding the depth and, and breadth of this problem in Canada. 80% um, of, our, of our participants were born in Canada, uh, about uh, three quarters identified as, as a female, uh, half were single, and 42, uh, almost 43% um, identified as uh, Muslim. So what were, what were the measures? Uh, what were the measures that we wanted to, to tap into the different um, areas? So first of all, mental health, right? So we wanted to look at different aspects of mental health, including depression, anxiety, uh, psychosomatic symptoms. So you know, the expression of, of mental health problems through the body, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, substance use, suicidal ideation and behavior, Obsessive, obsessive compulsive or obsessions and compulsions. And then we also wanted to understand uh, what the influence of, of people's experience of racism was. And so we had measures of racial microaggressions, everyday discrimination, major discrimination and internalized racism. So some of the, the concepts that Dr. Williams talked about. Uh, and we also you know, wanted to look at what are some of the, the factors that might buffer against the effects of racism. So we looked at social support, resilience and coping mechanisms, as well as uh, beliefs, uh, people's beliefs about mental illness, um, as well as their beliefs about treatment of mental illness. And finally, uh, the use of mental health services um, and um, self-esteem and life satisfaction. And I'll, I won't be talking about all of these. I know <laughs> Dr. Senna said I'll be talking about a lot of data. I won't be going over all of this, but, but I will be, I'll be talking about some of the key findings. So um, the first, I know this is a busy slide, but I think it's important to look at, this is our um, measure of everyday uh, racial discrimination. So what is it like for the people who participated in the survey on an, you know, on an everyday basis uh, for different types of, of um, racial discrimination? So you know, if we look at uh, the, just this top bit here, because uh, it's all the same, you have the, the total percentage of people that endorse that particular item, uh, and this is broken down and then into women and men. And so uh, we're looking at the frequency 
of these experiences. So the first is people acting as if they think you're not smart, right? Uh, and if you look, this is happening at least once a week. That's kind of the most frequent response, you know, with almost, you know, 40% of people saying that uh, this is an experience that they have. Um, and we also have treated with less uh, courtesy and respect. People act as if they're afraid of you, uh, you're threatened or harassed, poor services at restaurants or stores. So, 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 I mean, these are, this is what I meant by sad data. You see that people are experiencing on a very regular basis um, um, experiences of racial discrimination. So if we turn now to the key findings by mental health problem, so we know depression is a very, uh, depressive symptoms and depression is, is the most kind of common expression of, of mental health problems uh, worldwide. And uh, that's true in Canada as well. Uh, you know, rates of depression are, are the highest of all the, the, the uh, mental and behavioral disorders. And so this is a study we published in Depression and Anxiety. And what I'm show, what we're showing here is this is we've, we've kind of broken down the groups of uh, our participants into those that report experiencing low levels of everyday racial discrimination. So that measure I just showed you before, medium levels of racial discrimination high levels of racial discrimination and very high levels of uh, racial discrimination. So we took that measure of racial discrimination, we broke it into four categories, and now we're looking at the, um, the levels, the prevalence of depressive symptoms. And here, when we talk about depressive symptoms, these would be you know, clinical levels of depression. So you know, fairly severe uh, form of depression uh, as measured on, uh, uh, again, a validated measure. Um, the Center for Epidemiological Studies measure of depression. So we're, we're really assessing the prevalence of severe depressive symptoms in black people who, who have experienced racial discrimination. And what you notice is that, two, well, for overall, two thirds of participants actually reported severe depressive symptoms. Um, we found that there were higher rates among, among women, which is, which is actually what you would see in the gen, you know, just generally that, that women tend to report higher rates of depression. Um, so that, that kind of fits with, with what we know already. Those who are employed and those who were born in Canada also had higher rates of depression. What is striking here, I think if you can appreciate from the graphic, is that everyday racial discrimination was the best predictor of depressive symptoms and explained 25% of the variance in, in depressive symptoms. Those experiencing the highest level of racial discrimination were found to have uh, 36 times more likely to have severe depressive symptoms uh, when compared to those reporting the lowest level of racial discrimination. So there's also, you know, some, some we've looked at also by gender. So this is broken down by female and male. And just remember that, that um, a larger proportion of our sample uh, were, were, were women. So, uh, but as you can see, it grows, right? Um, as people experience more and more levels of, of uh, racial discrimination. We also looked at anxiety um, and the findings are similar, but slightly different. And in, in this case, different by gender. So this study assessed the prevalence of clinically significant anxiety symptoms in black people who have experienced racial discrimination. And here we looked at actually kind of two forms of racial discrimination. We looked at everyday racial discrimination, which is what is in this graph. We also looked at racial micro, uh, microaggressions. Um, in this case, nearly a third of participants, uh, and that's higher than the general Canadian population, endorse clinically significant levels of anxiety symptoms. And here, what we saw was a slightly different picture where men were reporting higher rates of anxiety symptoms as compared to women. Those who were unemployed were more likely to report anxiety. Uh, people who were separated and those who, who were reporting no family history of mental health problems had high, higher rates of anxiety. Um, and, and there's some potentially some interesting reasons for these findings that we, we can talk about maybe in the questions um, that I can go into. But, uh, Except for those reporting the greatest frequency of racial discrimination, there is again this trend, right? So uh, we, we go up the total and then it drops at the very highest level of racial discrimination. And there's a gender difference here as it describes. So for, for, for women, the, the, these are the gray bars uh, at the highest level, 
they don't experience or don't ex at least express the uh, a, a, a report anxiety symptoms. And part of this we hypothesize is because uh, when you're experiencing racial discrimination on a daily basis, uh, you know, sometimes uh, the, our bodies just shut down and this might be a way of, of coping with uh, that incredible stressor. Um, now, what's going on here exactly? We need to explore a little bit more but um, and follow up with that. Uh, what was uh, also interesting is that if we look at racial um, microaggressions, this story is a little bit different. It's a similar pattern. More racial, uh, more frequent racial microaggression experiences. There's going to be higher levels of anxiety symptoms. Um, but what we, we found here, we actually also looked at resilience as a protective factor. And in the case of psychological resilience, which is like this kind of a multi-dimensional, it has a lot of different um, sides to it. Uh, it. It's kind of a person's sense of purpose, a sense of perseverance a sense of uh, equanimity and authenticity or self-reliance, that those people who had, uh, and it was only among women who had a higher, uh, reported higher level of resilience, tended to have um, lower levels of anxiety despite high levels of, of racial microaggressions. So that was kind of an interesting finding there. Um, we also looked at PTSD. So Dr. Williams talked about racial trauma and Again, very stark data, right? So again, we're breaking it down by low, uh, mild, high, and very high levels of everyday um, racial discrimination. Um, and again, by gender, uh, where men are in the, the, these, these uh, gray bars, women in blue, and the total in the, in the darker blue. And what you see is actually uh, a little bit of a different pattern where it kind of steps up almost immediately when we go from the lowest level to the, the mild level of, um, uh, of, of uh, experiences of racial discrimination. So here we're talking about what percentage of people actually would meet a probable diagnosis of PTSD. So almost all of the par participants in this we, we, that we included in the study reported exposure to at least one traumatic event during a lifetime. And this was a measure of all sorts of different types of traumatic events, right? So it could be um, uh, a, a, um, an assault, it could be uh, the experience of a natural disaster, et cetera. Um, and, and so, you know, very high level of exposure to at least one traumatic event. Two thirds of participants reported probable PTSD uh, with no significant difference between men and women in this case. Participants born in Canada were actually more likely to experience significant PTSD symptoms compared to those born abroad. And there are some people who have talked about that protective factor of, of being born abroad and, and um, immigrating. Um, if we looked at kind of socio-demographic variables like uh, you know, age, gender, um, where a person was born, uh, educational level, all of these things, if we, we put that into a big model and say, how much does that predict whether you're gonna have PTSD symptoms? And it explains about a quarter of the variance. But when you add into that model, racial microaggressions, everyday uh, experiences of, of um, racism, internalized racism, um, you can explain twice as much of the variance. Uh, in PTSD symptoms. So this suggests an association between racism, different forms of racism, and PTSD. And I think Dr. Williams is an ex expert on that, and that, that is racial trauma, right? So we're not capturing, you know, in, in the typical kinds of experiences that people talk about of, 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 of traumas, we're not actually capturing the experiences of racism and how that accumulation of uh, race of, of racism leads to uh, the expression of, of uh, symptoms of PTSD. We also looked at um, so psycho psychosomatic symptoms. So you know different different groups of people have different ways of expressing uh, uh, psychological dis distress. Some groups of people psychologize, and some groups of people somaticize. And somaticize is you know where the presentation is very much felt in the body and reported uh, as, as physical symptoms, right? So what we were doing here was assessing the, the prevalence of probable psychosomatic uh, symptoms in black people 
who have experienced racial discrimination. And again, we're, we've broken it down, I'm sorry about the graphic here, but into those four same categories again. Um, what we know from the US literature is that uh, physical complaints are more common among black people as compared to other, other groups. Um, and in our data, we found that about eight out of 10 participants reported experiencing psychosomatic symptoms. And here it was a higher prevalence among women and among older participants. So those, I think it's 25 and, and older. Um, and once again, people experiencing more racial discrimination have more psychosomatic symptoms. So uh, everyday racial discrimination was positively associated with, the, with those symptoms. And we were also, in this case, again, looking at what are some of the positive or protective factors? And we found that the association between racial discrimination and psychosomatic symptoms was partially explained by how much resilience a person had. So the more resilience a person had, um, there was, a, there was a, a tempering of the relationship or association between exposure to racism and, and the expression of these psychosomatic symptoms. Here, being a woman is associated with a higher level of psychosomatic symptoms among those who are, who, who are experiencing racial discrimination. So uh, that's a lot of data. Uh, I'm gonna try to summarize and put it together, like what is the overall, what are the overall kind of messages here uh, by kind of psychosocial um, variables. So some of the socio-demographic characteristics of the people who participated in, in, in the study. So what we found was that if we look at gender, women reported generally a higher prevalence of psychosomatic symptoms, PTSD symptoms, and depressive symptoms. So um, we, you know, here are some, you know, in terms of psychosomatic symptoms, exposure to at least one trauma, uh, women are more, more likely than men, you know, by, by almost 15%. In terms of PTSD, there's also a pretty important gap there. In terms of depression, uh, an important gap there. The one exception is that men are reporting a higher prevalence of anxiety symptoms. Um, so those are some gender differences. There are also age differences. Now, our study was really focusing on, on black youth. So we, we kind of, you know, our, we, we our participants go up to the age of 40 and not beyond. So when we talk about, you know, kind of comparing by age, it's really people who are less than 25 and people who are older than 25, but up to 40. And here we found that black people age 25 and older uh, reported higher levels of psychosomatic symptoms, PTSD and depressive symptoms. And those who were younger uh, in this case would, would uh, actually report a lot more anxiety uh, than, than, than the older people in our study. In terms of socioeconomic status, um, those people who reported not being employed uh, had more anxiety uh, symptoms and more PTSD symptoms. And people who were employed uh, had more symptoms of depression and um, psychosomatic symptoms. Um, in terms of where a person is born, so people who are born in Canada actually had more of all the symptoms, uh, uh, really there was, seemed to be this protective factor of being uh, born uh, in another country and, and having uh, immigrated to Canada. In terms of education, we have um, black people with, with reported no formal education had more psychosomatic symptoms and depression. Those with a formal education, more PTSD and more anxiety symptoms. Um, I wanna make the point, so here we're seeing that there are higher prevalence of the major uh, psychological problems, mental health problems uh, among those participants in our study. And now we ask the question about mental health services, right? So um, you've got problems, you've got difficulties, challenges, and now you wanna seek services, um, right? So we heard from Dr. Williams what that's like. Um, our data are pretty much saying similar things, which is, you know, um, there's a pretty low level overall of, of use of, of, of mental health services, like 10%, higher among women than, than, than men. But I would say this is, this is lower than what I was able to found, find in terms of the overall Canadian population of seeking services. It's probably somewhere around half uh, uh, of, the, of what we would expect to see. Um, and given that one in five people have a mental health problem, this is, this is not representative of what we would expect. 
What about experiences of racism in mental health services? So what is it like for, for Black people who are seeking services? 53% of our sample said that they experienced racism in receiving mental health services. That is not acceptable. So what about those who have exper had experiences with mental health services, whether good or bad? Would they go back? Would they reuse services? This is the likelihood that, that of, of our people in our sample who would do that if they had it. And basically, if you look, it's about, you know, almost 50% of the sample would say, not really. No, thank you. <laughs> right? So I'm going to just skip ahead to the conclusions, and, and then we can take questions. So, uh, you know, the conclusions for this, of course, these are stark and, and troubling data. Um, I, I would promote that we should be adopting an anti-racist approach to mental health care. Uh, and... Uh, to, to appropriately address racial issues in ther the therapeutic environment. We need to promote cultural humility and awareness. Uh, prevention and mental health programs have to provide mental health professionals with culturally adapted tools um, to address these, the, the mental health issues among, among Black communities. And we need to dispense with the Canadian colorblind approach because it's not, it's not working. And in fact, it perpetuates uh, racism. Um, and we need to also, you know, people presenting for mental health services who present with these types of problems, need, we need to evaluate their experience of racism. So I'll stop there and, uh, and take questions. And I think what I'd like to do actually is invite uh, Dr. Sena and Dr. Dengugua to come up and maybe answer some questions along with me. Or you can stay there, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Before this, maybe just say something we also know that uh, racial discrimination is associated to blood pressure, yeah. diabetes, cancer. Yeah. So we need more research. Hi, it was great to look at the information that you provided. Um, I was wondering, did you take a look at persons with disabilities, those from the pride community? I know you can't present everything, but did you do those subsets or include it as a part of your sample size? For disability, we have the data. We, we never explore them. No. Uh, because there are a lot of data, and it is nice to explore all of them. For sexual orientation, mm -hmm. uh, there were like um, a mistake in like in the way the question was were, formulated, and we are not. We don't believe in the data. That's why we don't okay. the, the data. We ask the question. We use a question uh, from a US survey. Mm -hmm. But we felt we felt like the way it was asked, it, there was uh, some kind of misunderstanding okay. from the mm -hmm. some bias, and we think it, is, it was not good. And we we don't use the data because we are we don't believe like it okay. is, the data are good enough. Yeah, the reason why I asked that, and then I'm done, um, is that uh, you've taken a picture of the most privileged privileged populations, to be honest with you. If you've got French, you've got English. If you're young and you're vital, yes, that's beautiful. Um, but we're talking about, you know, um, looking at those who are over 40 and who's been embedded mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, entrenched in a system um, of um, racism over a period of time. I, I'd love to see what those results would be. Maybe a future survey, who knows? Um, so it's just one of those pieces that are reflecting the intersectionality mm. and the compound effects of racism with that, that would be a beautiful picture to see in the future. Thank you. Hi, I have a question. I was really struck by um, the demographic piece around the 42% uh, respondents being Muslim. And I'm sure that maybe, obviously that you found that out before you developed uh, your questions. So maybe there's not an opportunity to further go into overlapping experiences of anti-Blackness and Islamophobia yeah. or anti-Black Islamophobia. But I'm wondering in the findings and the write-up if you'll be able to capture any data that speaks to that. Um, just because there's so there's so, so little research and work that is speaking to experiences of anti-Black Islamophobia and mental health. And it's a really uh, pronounced area. You know, we know the overlapping experiences of discrimination. And I just um, would wonder if you're going to go there. I would suggest if you're if you have. Yeah, uh, maybe I can say something on this uh, uh, because it is like the, the assumption about uh, intersectionality. What we can observe, for example, 
uh, black women who declared they, they were Muslim, they are like the, the, the they all, like almost all of them experience everyday racial discrimination and, and major racial discrimination in uh, like all cities, like in, in the healthcare system, um, um, uh, by police, uh, but also in education. So it is important to say that, and 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 they are part of of, of the population who present the high level of uh, mental health problems. So uh, we 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 explore a lot of of this data. We, we already explore uh, explore this data, but we need to to have a paper on this scope. And I think it was not important to 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 bring this message on in all the papers, and because it is like a real important message for Canada. And, and we will reveal some things. Uh, mm. The fact that it is, uh, <laughs> we have a lot of data and not enough time to publish on them. And uh, I'm sure it is something to explore, but now we have the second wave and we have to, um, I think we can explore it longitudinal. If we're looking at uh, news, I've done so many presentations about anti-Black Islamophobia, policing, media, news, mental health, Black Muslim women and Muslim women are the first people and the largest group who receive abusive, physical, anti-Black Islamophobia and physical violence, uh, which has a negative impact. Of course, it's going to have a negative impact on mental health. So it's actually incredibly critical if this is coming out in the research for it to be prioritized and contribute to the data. So I would just really uh, encourage that. It's very sobering all the data that you've had, and I applaud you and your research team in amassing all this data. Um, I had a question about the methodology. And um, so I'm, I, I work, so I'm, my name is Evangeline, and I work with um, our partners looking at um, the evaluation of post-secondary helplines. And I also sit at a panel with uh, Kai Hai. And what we find is kind of similar to your, uh, your participants, where it's 76% female. Um, and there's often this question, how representative are they? And especially if it's an online survey, um, and it might be also related to the help seeking. And um, so it just wondering if you can hum a few bars on how representative the population is and uh, the link of that to help seeking. Because I, I think, I wonder if, if we had more maybe males or um, maybe more of the... Um, say LGBTQI population also, if there would be an impact or implications for the help seeking. The weak air green is not a representative sample, it is a convenient sample. Um, what we have to know, like all of this data, there is not in, there was nothing in depression in within the black communities, nothing in PTSD, nothing in anxiety. But we have to start some work. And people tell us like. It is impossible, don't try. It is impossible to, to recruit more than uh, to 200 black people. Don't try. We try hard, but the good news is we are doing a, a research right now in, in vaccination and we were able to recruit more than uh, 3,000 black people across Canada. And, and, yeah. and even we, we are working hard to make this representative and, and we will waste the, the sample, but we have to, to, to learn and we agree it is not representative. And about um, uh, that on, 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 on women and men, uh, the fact that if you, if you don't try hard to work with men, black men, you will not work with black men, not at all. And I can tell you, we work hard to have like more than 20 percent of black people in our sample. And if even in, within the, the white community, we made a, a research in Quebec that was the same within all communities. Uh, in France, we, uh, with Daniel Delivar, we did a research on uh, a, a post-secondary students. 
and and the the percentage uh, we, uh, in, uh, between men and women was exactly the same. And uh, it is not easy. We know it is not easy. And and for example, for this study um, on vaccination, we oriented the study to work with more men, and still it is not easy. But we know the problem, and also for uh, LGBTQ people and other people, it is important. People with disability, it is important to work with, and we are trying hard to do it. Thank you. Um, I, I do have to apologize in advance because you're both males and I'm going to ask you this question, so please don't feel any type of way. Um, however, as we look through this data and there's so much females and you guys talk about psychosomatic symptoms, I think all of my fellow sisters in this room can talk about how ovarian issues, period issues, things like that are so commonly overlooked and we can see that in female studies. And when it comes to black female studies, it's kind of, you know, get over it. We talk about deaths and childbirth being more predominant in the Black community. So because we're shunned when we talk about these issues, and I'm saying we as a whole right now, what did this study do to let women know that those type of somatic issues should be included? Because they're so often silenced when they do that. And if not, moving forward, how do you want to ensure that you represent women's health issues as psychosomatic issues. <laughs> and again, I apologize because I'm sure you probably don't even know about half the women issues that we have. No, so. but, but we, we have a member of our team who, who is a woman who could talk You can't keep throwing her under the bus like this. <laughs> You're like, oh, this question's hard. Oh, give it to the woman, right? <laughs> I don't, I know it is a woman's problem, but I know a lot of black men in my environment with back pain too. Mm -hmm. And this back pain. No, no, let, no. I know, I know, I know. Let me, let me go there. I'm sorry. Let me go there. Um, yeah, and 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 maybe I think I sometimes go to answer that question. I will really think so. You know what? Because. I, I, I would, I, I don't know, uh, the, the example I have uh, is about that data. And, and when we look at the data, uh, what is the, 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 maybe the most important is when you look at the, the symptoms, um, women, these symptoms are, were more prevalent among, among women. Um, I also think we have to think about solutions, what we can do. And uh, it, is, it was not part of our work. Like our work was to reveal the data first because we did not have this data in Canada. And it was important to recruit that data and reveal them. And what we can do with them is the next step. And we have to think about it. And, and we cannot just us think about it and we have to include more people to think about it and to also bring a gender perspective uh, in, in this data. And we need this gen gender perspective. And uh, this is my answer for today because uh, I, 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 cannot, I cannot say like, it is like something that we think on because the first thing that was most important for us is like, what data we have, what we can say about this, this data. And, and sometimes you have like uh, 3,000 uh, words to, to, to mm -hmm. make an article. And this is the most important word to reveal the data. But I agree we have to have a, a gender perspective to, to work on this data and, 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 and see what they tell us uh, in this perspective. I'll add one small thing, carefully, <laughs> cautiously. Just, just that I, I agree with that. We needed to just characterize because there was nothing there, right? So uh, now, how do we interpret those data? I think, I think also we need to look at, you know, are we actually, uh, you know, we have we have the DSM that tells us this is how uh, mental and behavioral disorders present, right? And is it representative of of, of black people? You know, no, right? So, so, so these data maybe tell us something about how we should be thinking about uh, changing our measures of mental health problems, 
adapting those uh, because <laughs> there's a there's a problem there. I think uh, that that's been described in, in in other research that you know that that you know we're maybe missing mental health problems because we're not capturing symptoms uh, that that are presented a particular way, and, and so. So I think it, it opens our eyes to this question and to having these these further discussions about what we need, what our next steps are. And I think we need to adapt uh, absolutely and and incorporate. I'm sorry, we have to stop there. I'm really sorry because we already have uh, ten minutes. We are like twenty minutes late. Let me give you some um, instructions for for the next session. Like. Um, Thank you.